kindred friends, and welcome to the Radical Emergence podcast, where we're having conversations at the edge of transformation. We are your hosts. I'm Dr. Jen Pierre Rich, and with me is my friend, co host, and co collaborator, Dr. Sally Adams Jones. Please check out our bios in the show notes where you will find links to our work, websites, and can find ways to connect with us. If you're not already following, hit that subscribe button, ring that bell, and join our mailing list so you can stay up to date on new episodes as they drop. Hello everybody, Sally here. This exciting project consists of about 26 episodes in all, dedicated to better defining and understanding transformation on all its levels of reality. That's personal, social, as well as ecological. We're gonna ask, what is transformation? Why bother? Why do we need it? And what does it feel like or look like? We'll also ask, can we induce it or perhaps accidentally block it? These are really important questions for growth. We draw not only on our hard-won life experience, we are also transdisciplinarians. So what the heck is that? Well, it means we want to understand transformation from as many lenses as possible, including formal academic disciplines and discourses, art, media, and popular culture. Importantly, we draw from our living experience. So we are experts, so to speak, but mostly in just one small but highly critical area, our own suffering, and the medicines that we've both used to transform our own lives. So to this end, we've also added decades of committed practices, as well as formal degrees, including specific in-depth studies in the mechanisms of transformation. Because we needed to understand this healing journey for ourselves. Does this entitle us to help others? You bet, absolutely. Because it is by sharing our stories, knowledge and direct experience that we offer sane, sober, practical tools for living on the ground of life. So welcome, strap in, hang on, and enjoy the ride as we deep dive into a universe of transformation. Hello everybody and welcome back. It's a beautiful fall here on Vancouver Island and it's raining and it's just perfect weather to hunker down with my dear colleague and friend, Jen Pierre-Rich. Hi, Jen. Ellie, it's so good to be here with you. (laughs) Sorry, I put you on the spot there, Jen. I was just saying how wonderful it is to hunker down and spend time with you and with everybody else who's truly interested in transformation. Our entire podcast is about that. I would just like to remind listeners to go back and catch up because we've carefully sequenced these episodes. So if there's a little complexity this week, we usually refer to stuff we've already covered extensively hour per hour. So for example, I'll look at a bit of information about states today and we've done a whole episode on that and unfolding consciousness. Yeah, so let's keep it in sequence. That's advisable and uh, it'll be easier. We've got some fairly complex information today on one of our truly important topics. We're gonna look at the difference between multiple intelligences and I'm gonna try and also look at the difference between that and consciousness itself. And we're just, going to give an overview of what's happening out there in academia and in um, the world of research because Jen and I are not neuroscientists. We have not spent 50 years 
dissecting brains as some of our colleagues have. We are generalists who look at the entire field of transformation. And so we're gonna give an overview and hopefully if you're interested in some of the deeper topics, go do some research and we'll give names and you can go do that yourself. So we'll look at what is intelligence and why is that important to transformation? And a little bit of history of how our understanding of that has evolved. So we're here to understand transformation. And in my view, humble view, transformation includes a few processes, one of which is learning, healing, and evolving. If you cluster those together, you've got transformation. And in order to learn, which is number one, there must be intelligence present. So this is why we've included a whole episode on this, because um, there can be evolution without a very sophisticated level of intelligence. We know that all life forms evolve, but life itself is evolving to express higher and higher intelligences, complexity of thinking and feeling and consciousness. So that's why it's important to us that intelligence itself seems to evolve. It is itself transforming. And we use our own intelligence in order to transform. It's, it's a wonderful interconnected capacity that we have. There's an intelligent field and we are living in that and expressing that. So that's one of the um, complex topics that has not been solved, even though there are all these wonderful people discussing it, psychologists, educators, cognitive scientists, neurobiologists, spiritual practitioners, is intelligence the same as consciousness? And is consciousness causal? In other words, did that come first and everything evolved from that? Or is it arising and complexifying? Is it getting more and more sophisticated? Causal or emergent? Big argument, nobody has solved that. So Jen and I are certainly not gonna solve that this week. <laughs> We're just giving an overview of some of the arguments and what's happening out there in research. So a wonderful academic called RJ Sternberg, uh, whose work I'm fairly familiar with in creativity and intelligence says this, intelligence viewed, viewed narrowly there seem to be almost as many definitions of intelligence as there are experts asked to define it. So to date, we have at least 70 definitions. I was doing the research on that, but there seem to be some commonalities and Jen and I are just gonna pick on those and um, simplify and, and help people understand that. So um, we can approximate an answer, and here's one of them. A property that an individual agent has as it interacts with its environment. It's related to the agent's ability to succeed or profit with respect to some goal or objective, which depends on how able the agent is to adapt to these objectives and the environment. So that's pretty complex, let's just break that down. There are agents who are relating to their environment and intelligence is considered to be relational in that way. It's an interaction between the agent, that could be us, that could be your dog, that could be a gecko on your wall, and its environment, 
and how successfully it adapts to change. That's one of the definitions of intelligence. In other words, it's so close to Jen and our whole episode, this whole 26 episodes on transformation. So learning itself allows every single individual manifestation of life to succeed in its environment through learning. And if it can manage to learn and transform and adapt, it's successful. So intelligence is a very helpful capacity for every alive being on the planet. So we know that across the 15 or well, 13.8 billion years of evolution, intelligence has also complexified. It sort of started off as sensation and perception, and it sort of got to develop memory capacity and discrimination capacities and imagination, reasoning, intuition, and these all helped organisms to perform better and to succeed. So at the bottom of all these capacities that we can develop is the ability to flourish. So that's why we have intelligence and it's the capacity to acquire capacity. That's H. Woodrow's definition of that. And I really enjoy that. So before I hand it back to Jen, I just want to briefly cover the three main views of why people find it hard to distinguish between consciousness and intelligence. So Jen and I are not going to solve this problem because far better brains than ours are going to be arguing this for another 200 years because we can't really see inside the brain even though we have MRIs, um, people can study the brain, but they can't study the mind or consciousness so well. They can look at brainwave states. We've discussed that. And it seems that consciousness is that ability to move through states. We've looked at that. So go back to that episode. But humans have this complex neural structure in their brain that seems to be the most sophisticated brain on the planet although we have dolphins and we have primates and octopi that are extremely intelligent we seem to have the most complex brain structure so it's good we, that we understand it and how it arose so the three ways people have looked at this and they're broken into camps there's one way that called panpsychism that says the whole field is intelligent and that that intelligence gave rise to our complexity. So spiritual practitioners, famous ones like Satguru would believe that, that consciousness was primary and we arose out of that. Then there are other people that say that consciousness arises almost from nothing, from the Big Bang, and that consciousness itself emerges, and look what's emerged is Homo sapiens brain, that this is so far the most complex and amazing structure and intelligent structure that has evolved. And we are the pinnacle so far of consciousness. And then, of course, there's other ways of looking at it. The third way, which is that consciousness only belongs to humans. And those are normally sort of the neuroscientists, the medical practitioners, anesthesiologists who put us to sleep and look at consciousness and the brain states. They would say that it's only humans that are conscious and everything else has a level of intelligence, but it's not the same as us. So that's the kind of painting of the general field. Jen and I are stepping into minefields here because so many disciplines are looking at this. And Jen and I are, are educators around transformation. So we generalize and look at the whole field and what's going on. 
I would love to hear from you, Jen, what you got up to researching this week on intelligence. Well, it's so wild to think about that intelligence is undergoing a transformation and our own evolution personally is contributing to that evolution of intelligence. That's so cool and wild. And I love being um, par part of that with you consciously here on this show and just celebrating that, you know, that we arise from that intelligence. Um, and that is a beautiful, very cool thing. It is so good to be back here with you again on the Radical Emergence podcast. We are in red hot pursuit of all things transformation. And in this episode, one of our goals is to redefine even what we mean when we say intelligence, which is, as we've said, really important when we're talking about transformation. So as Sally mentioned, there's endless ways, over 70 ways to define transformation, but most dictionaries would define intelligence as the ability to acquire and apply knowledge to solve problems and adapt to new situations. Cambridge Dictionary defines intelligence as, quote, the ability to learn, understand, and make judgments or have opinions that are based on reason. And I want to emphasize that word right there at the end, reason. And what we're trying to do here is move away from defining intelligence exclusively by reason and becoming aware that intelligence is incredibly dynamic and much more prolific than something just about reason, right? So there's this growing movement to redefine intelligence beyond reason to include things like wisdom and insight and flow states and spiritual, ecological, emotional, creative abilities. Um, and that shift towards a more holistic understanding of intelligence that embraces diverse and divergent forms of learning and responding and problem solving on all levels of reality, not just cognitive, it really changes how we understand and how we align with intelligence. Because that includes then, as Sally is pointing to, the intelligence, not only of nature, but the universe as well. Um, and so as part of that shift, Sally's going to talk in the next part deeper about the work of, uh, of Gardner, who um, uh, Howard Gardner, who introduced eight types of intelligence in a book called Frames of Mind way back in 1983. So this is not necessarily new, but it seems to be coming into the fore of our collective consciousness now. And so this movement to redefine intelligence is about celebrating our capacities in many different forms on all levels of reality. We want to propose to you that we are many intelligencing, and I'm using that word like I would use Googling, that we are many intelligencing beings that exist as fields of transformation within fields of transformation. And so I'm saying that like a verb. Intelligence is something we are actively doing. We are intelligencing. Um, one of our dear friends is of the show is Jordan Gruber, and he wrote, wrote a book with James Fadiman called Your Symphony of Selves. And we're going to put a link to that information of the, for the book in the show notes. But the book is about something called the multiple selves theory. And it basically suggests that we're not just one single self, that we have many selves and that those selves oscillate throughout the day, throughout different scenarios and situations and throughout the seasons of our life. And that multiple selves theory, it really resonates with Sally and I. Um, we found it to be true in our experience. And by extension, I find that intelligence operates a lot of the same way. So according to the multiple selves theory, with enough, when we put enough attention and, and, and energy and self-awareness, we can learn to meet a given situation with the appropriate self that is called for in that situation. 
So we, we were working to be like internally flexible and have a mutable sense of self so that we can, you know, show up in any situation as the self that we need. And I believe, and I would propose that as many intelligencing beings, that intelligence is operating a lot in the same way, that we have many intelligences that are available to us and that we can bring them forward and we can apply the type of intelligence that is needed in any given situation. We can show up in a situation with the optimal form of intelligence that we need in order to heal and grow and transform. Now, I want to say that a lot of critics of multiple intelligences theory say that what we're pointing to are actually personality traits um, or talents or characteristics. But I really prefer to align myself and we want to align our show with the theory of multiple intelligences, because it's true to my experience that we come from this deep intelligence, as Sally is pointing to, you know, of, of where consciousness is arising from, we come from that. And that deep intelligence is expressing through us in very powerful ways. I want to give you two quotes from two very smart guys that you probably know, Albert and Stephen. Albert Einstein said, the measure of intelligence is the ability to change. And Stephen Hawking said, intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. Both of these quotes align intelligence with the ability to move and adapt with change, which, which is what this podcast is all about, participating with transformation consciously, gaining new knowledge, meeting the challenges that we face at every level of reality so that we can grow and heal and, and offer our healing as a contribution to the world. So this ability to adapt and move with transformation is something that Sally and I have in spades. It's what this podcast is all about. It's something that we're expressing here and that we're amplifying out into the universe. And that has ripple effects far beyond what we can even imagine. And as you're listening to this podcast, your transformative intelligence is expanding as well. And that, my friends, I believe is a beautiful loop of love. So with that, I'm going to toss it back to Sally. And I can't wait to go deeper into our many forms of intelligences. Yeah, thank you, Jen, so much for pointing out about the ability to change and adapt as one of the understandings for intelligence and and how you also pointed out that we've become overly identified with rational thought as the only form of intelligence yeah in fact has become a liability as jen and i have pointed out on just about every episode here that being stuck in the rational you know, that kind of started the period of modernism. We call modernism with the celebration of rational problem solving, which was a fantastic flowering of the left brain in Homo sapiens. And um, that's been steadily sort of exaggerated. And as science came on board, the rational thought became almost godlike. And that was reflected in schools. And it's become very problematic. It's now the cause, Jen and I believe, of our global issues because that's been deified in some way and it's so limited. So in schools, for example, in the old days when kids were brought off the farms and put in schools, they started trying to measure their intelligence so that they could go on to high school. Even high school was a privilege for kids in those days. So did they have a high IQ was the way they separated kids. No, once you've had a couple of years in school, you'll go back to the farm, you'll go and become a blacksmith and you get to go to high school. And if at high school, your rational thought flourishes, you might have the opportunity to go to Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, etc. So rational thought became the only measurement for intelligence and schools had a lot to do with that. 
how numerical were you? How, uh, how was your language? And even in America today, they call them the STEM subjects are the only important ones. That's science, technology, English, and math. So everything else became subsidiary. All the other intelligences were devalued. And this is what is causing a crisis today. So we call that left brain chauvinism, how that arose out of modernism and patriarchy celebrating the left brain and devaluing anything else uh, that became entrenched in education systems and it's just self-replicating now and it's causing a lot of, of crisis in our world. So let's just take a look at how that's changing though in some education systems. People began to realize, oh, actually kids do learn in different ways. They are not just rational thinkers. They also have auditory capacities, visual capacities, and kinesthetic capacities. So the curriculum began to expand a little bit. Um, they might have sent you out on an on a, on a exploration of your artistic skills, and um, they might have made you play rugby in England. Uh, the you know sport hasn't been around that long. These are all brand new amendments to a very stereotypical curriculum. But slowly but surely, academics who specialized in learning and intelligence realized there are, there's way more than three. There's six. Howard Gardner said, and then he later changed that to nine. And other people like Ken Wilber have now changed that. The last one I saw was like 24. So these were called lines of intelligence. And here's a couple of them. Verbal, linguistic, obviously, it's one that's always been measured. Logical, math, mathematical, that's abstract, conceptual. Spatial, visual, which is the artistic ability bodily kinesthetic, which is physical skills, musical, and then added to those very important interpersonal skills, which is between people, emotional intelligence, and intrapersonal, which is your ability to feel your body, name feelings and needs, develop ethics and values naturalist intelligence, which is the ability to read your environment and understand systems and how we're interdependent. And Wilbur himself really emphasized the existential intelligence, which was what he called the spiritual line of intelligence. So that's at least nine. So how do you measure that at school? Metrics are just impossible. Like they, Schools are now dumbing us down because they want easy one word answers. They want to pump you through the factory of education. They want to get you to Harvard. It's all skewed towards market forces for employment and status and, and consumption and money making. We are not being recognized as these multiply intelligent beings. Not all intelligences are ranked the same by some people who are powerful and important in giving funding. So we're changing that. Uh, it's very important for the survival of our future because creativity itself has been diminished because of this. And to problem solve our way out of this mess, we need to be creative. Number one, we cannot fix this with the same level of consciousness or the same intelligence that has actually destroyed our universe and turned it into an object for us to consume. So that little history of how we've devalued intelligences is important. One more figure I'd like to mention is Daniel Goleman, who's got this beautiful, easy thing to remember. And I'd like to leave our listeners with that before I give it back to Jen. He's spoken about IQ, which we all know was the thing measured in IQ tests at school, EQ, which is intelligence that is emotional, the intra and interpersonal, getting to know your body and how it functions. Your body is just as intelligent as your head. That was being denied really until Goleman pointed out EQ. 
He then went on to develop SQ, which is our social intelligences, understanding that that is equally important as IQ and EQ. And the latest one is AQ. We're really going to need AQ because that's the adversity quotient. How resilient are we? How adaptable are we as organisms? So that's, if you just want to briefly think of where are you on the spectrum? How many multiple intelligences do I have? Do I have some IQ, some EQ, some SQ, and some AQ? Because they're all super important, not only for transforming our own lives, but for transforming our environment. And we're going to go and look coming up now. Jen's going to introduce us to a much more open, expansive view of the field of intelligence. It's not just us and our brain, it's our whole body is intelligent. That's what yoga has been teaching for 3000 years that the whole body thinks and responds as intelligent. And now we're understanding ecological intelligence. So I'd love, Jen, this is your field. You did your PhD and in, in your master's in eco-psychology. I would love to hear your wisdom on this. Yes, perfect. Yes, I um, and I'm going to talk about that in part three. In this section, um, I do want to just give a nod to, to a to a broadening of our um, a, a awareness of intelligence in a way that perhaps um, our listeners may not have heard about. Um, but yes, we definitely will go into the ecological intelligence, Sally. Um, in just a few minutes. And I love listening to you talk about, um, outline the different forms of intelligence and, you know, how am I like managing and being a good steward of these various types of intelligence in, within me? Um, and I think that's such an important part of self-awareness, um, an essential part of self-awareness, I would say even. So yeah, I love that. So let's talk about neurodivergence as neurodivergent traits as forms of intelligence. So I want to say that the right brain comes in a variety of types. And I don't mean left and right brain, which we talk a lot about on this show and Sally is an expert at, but I, I mean the right brain, like the ideal brain. So I want to say that the right brain comes in a variety of types, and that is what neurodivergence is all about at its core. So again, we're not talking about IQ scores um, when we talk about intelligence here. IQ scores are one way to talk about intelligence, but not the only way. And what we're doing here are we're exploring new and more holistic ways to understand intelligence. So different types of intelligence exist among us and they exist among people with different IQ scores. So as an example, my beloved daughter, Frances, has developmental disabilities and her IQ is lower than average and she struggles with a lot of cognitive tasks and insight tasks, uh, metacognition tasks that a lot of us take for granted. But it's amazing how intelligent she is. In many ways, she is more intelligent than people that have incredibly high IQ scores. Her ability to live in the moment is a profound form of intelligence. Her ability to not dwell in the past and the future is exactly what many neurotypicals are looking for. It's what everybody that does meditation is looking for. It's enlightenment, really. And I, I wish I could live as fully in the present moment as, as much as Francis does, but my brain likes to oscillate between the past and the future, right? And so I spent a lot of time there. Francis doesn't. Her brain doesn't care to do that. And to me, that's really incredible. And she's also got a way with people. She can break the ice and connect with total strangers with ease. Um, she has no persona. She has no social front. 
And that is real magic. That's her profound social intelligence at work. Um, she has a medical condition similar to fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, she's my adopted daughter, but her biological mother overdosed on a seizure medication while she was pregnant with Francis. So her brain, Francis's brain has been hardwired in a certain way. And in the past, <clears throat> we might have said her brain was damaged or disordered, but we're moving away from this pathologized view of the brain and honoring the struggles, yes, but also the gifts that come with neurodivergent brains. And there's this great movement happening right now, which I'm really proud to be part of, and I know Sally is too, um, where we're celebrating and honoring neurodiversity as having unique forms of intelligence. And so many people are leading that, um, but at the, at the forefront is my Franny, who is literally changing the world with her rare forms of intelligence. And in fact, I was found it really interesting when I was doing research about this, that there are corporations, um, major corporations around the world that are looking for employees with neurodivergent traits because they realize that specialization comes with massive benefits. And having neurodivergence myself and being a mom of a neurodivergent kid, I understand the struggles. And so I'm not romanticizing what it means to be neurodivergent. But we can keep those struggles in the center while also focusing on the gifts that they bring. So as a neurodivergent person, I have dyslexia and I have post-traumatic stress disorder. Both of those are under the umbrella of neurodivergence. So I'm dealing with a lot of wonderful weirdness in my brain. And I think of my dyslexic brain as a form of intelligence, as a form of intelligence, even though it's incredibly frustrating. Um, there's a kind of non-locality about my mind that's really lovely and that allows me to express myself creatively in really unique ways. Um, as I mentioned, I have post-traumatic stress disorders, disorder, and one of the ways, ways that shows up for me is in hypervigilance. And so hypervigilance regularly dysregulates my, 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 my nervous system. It's very frustrating to be a hypervigilant person. And it's very frustrating to love a hypervigilant person, as my loved ones have told me. <laughs> but it is also a gift. It's a gift of survival to be hypervigilant. Um, it's a beautiful thing to be able to have many tabs open in my brain at one time, to be incredibly situationally aware, to want to feel safe and secure, right? Those are actually perks in a very uncertain and dangerous world. And so, you know, there's there are advantages. And, and so I want to impress here that there are advantages to being hypervigilant. And so I'm really glad that we're shifting from thinking about these kind of neurodivergent intelligences as a collection of problems that need to be fixed to seeing us as people, unique people, unique people with very unique gifts and having the right brain for us, right? So pathologizing brains as not right, it causes a lot of pain in the world. And you may have been touched by that pain. I know Sally and I have been touched by that pain. So we want to impress that every brain is the right brain, perfect, just the way it is. The brain's intelligence really and truly can only be appreciated and honored for how it is if we accept it as it is instead of putting it into these very limiting boxes of neurotypical expectations and norms. So I'm going to give it back to Sally. I can't wait to hear what you have to say. And then we're going to go deeper into some ecological intelligence. Back to you, Sally. Yeah, Jen, I think you touched on a really important point, and it's it's in all of us that the left brain tends to pathologize and objectify. It pathologizes anything that's not like it, and tends to devalue and and rank 
uh, anything that's not like itself. So we're moving away from pathologizing, as you said, that word is so important um, that rational IQ was valued as the only intelligence and that everything else was made to be a medical problem. I, how did that happen? That this array of intelligences became medical problems to be solved by the medical left brain so that it had something to fix because the left brain is all about control and survival and order and problem solving. Whereas we need all these other intelligences, expression, creativity, intuition, imagination. And yeah, it's a lovely to hear about your daughter, Franny. Thank you, Jen, for sharing that and your own divergences. And I certainly have mine, uh, we all do. And instead of pathologizing ourselves out of perfectionism, we could now perhaps think of this as mapping our diversities. And there are things, psychographs, you can take a psychograph and you can explore your different lines of intelligence, see yourself as this symphony of capacity. And which ones can you develop? Um, hmm, maybe I need to work more on, I do, I need to work on my numerical intelligence. I really do. <laughs> um, and I have these lines of intelligence. I have visual, spatial, kinesthetic, and existential. Uh, those are kind of, and intrapersonal and interpersonal. So I could map my psychograph be very different from um, people I've dated, for example, and sometimes two people with different psychographs work as a pair because they fill in the gaps. And sometimes that's a disaster. One of the beautiful things about Jen and me is I imagine our psychographs are pretty similar. And so we flow beautifully. It's, it's, it's a gift to share a similar psychograph. Um, so just thinking, I was thinking when you were talking about that Einstein, someone like Einstein was considered retarded at school. He failed many years. They thought this, this student's never even gonna learn how to speak. He is, and that word retarded was from that era. So that's why I used it. It's the part of the pathologizing of unique brains. Luckily, he didn't let anybody stop him and came up with all these amazing uh, understandings of consciousness and mapping that through math. Amazing. So yeah, I just want to talk about savants like Einstein. There are so many neuroatypical brains that are genius brains. So one of the definitions that actually Gardner used, and I don't like it, he said, intelligence is doing the right thing at the right time. And it's an ability, an executive function. It's like most of the intelligences that come up with unique ideas are considered to be doing the wrong thing. So we really need to reconsider this. So savants, for example, um, I know in the visual field, because that's where I've worked the longest, uh, there's a beautiful young man, Michael, who can go in a helicopter over the city, any city, major city, for 10 minutes, look at the skyline and fly back to the studio and replicate it absolutely perfectly. He, he has remembered the whole skyline and can reproduce it, his hand, eye, visual, spatial gifts. He is truly a savant. And yet he never does the right thing at the right time. So that's an old fashioned definition. So yeah, great talent, um, genius. We don't even really talk about that anymore. So, you know, that was a modernist idea like during the Renaissance, there were some male genii, apparently in those days it was considered masculine, uh, a masculine capacity. Women were never geniuses. Um, but we know now differently that that was just that those stories were hidden. Genius is distributed across genders, across cultures, across diversity of neuroatypicalness. So how we start thinking about intelligence as that line of development is 
that line of intelligence is developed to high talent, which is what we'd call genius, we need to rethink that. And we also need to think about our schooling that is really dumbing that down because it's turning us into little sausages to be put through the factory. So we're, we're in a crisis because multiple intelligence has, has been repressed. So luckily, this is opening up. Women can now exhibit all their intelligence. They're still at risk. Jen and I have discussed this recently, how women who exhibit a lot of lines of intelligence are discriminated against. They're sexually not selected for yet in the common conversation. It's not sexy for women to have a lot of intelligence lines. That's going to have to change, and it will. It's coming. And for men, it's not sexy to show some of the other intrapersonal skills. Uh, having fully embodied intelligence has been a challenge for men. So we're opening up all these lines of intelligence to everybody now. And this is an, a bright future for us if we can manage it in time. So I would like to end this little section with a quick look at how intelligence is moving from carbon-based life because it's been traditionally thought of as something that's biological and alive to artificial intelligence and silicone-based platforms. We don't know where intelligence is going. It may well move out of carbon-based biology to silicone platforms and it may even, there, there might even be a hybrid at some point between biology and, well, carbon and silicon intelligence forms. So we have what's traditionally called authentic intelligence, which is us, all sentient life. There's artificial intelligence, which we're now facing and the challenges with that. And there's a kind of synthesis of those two. So intelligence, we, we can't even map this yet because we don't know where it's going. And um, we've got to be really careful about that. But that's another whole episode. We're not going to look at that. I would like to end my little section with thinking about celebrating the diverse forms of intelligence that are alive today. And I made a little list, so I'm just going to read it, of some of my favorite animals that exhibit intelligence that humans don't have. So I want to decenter humanity from thinking it's the most intelligent form of life, which is traditionally what most professors are trying to prove, that we're at the center of the universe. Um, that we're the pinnacle of evolution and that we hold the highest level of consciousness, which is a form of sentience that is aware of its own sentience. Uh, some animals don't have that. And some have ways of being intelligent that we can't even imagine. So. I just would like to run through a list of those because I'm madly in love with them. And it's just honoring unique, diverse forms. So, first of all, as we said, intelligence is relational between an organism and its environment and its adaptive capacity. That's how it succeeds. So each of these animals that I'm going to mention has a relationship with its context. That's how it's evolved its intelligence. And without that context, it's very vulnerable. So that's why Jen and I always talk about protecting spaces for intelligence. If the spaces go, the intelligence will go and those levels of consciousness. So just think about these, that bats and snakes can see infrared that we can't. Whales and elephants hear sounds that are out of our ear range and those sounds they can pick up for hundreds of miles. 
Turtles have magnetic field sensors. Sharks and skates can detect electrical fields. Our little common garden sparrows and deer can detect nutrients in some of the plants like amino acids. They know which plants that they need to eat. Catfish have taste buds outside of their bodies. <laughs> That's what's amazing. Bees can communicate um, and their abdomens shrink and swell in response to magnetic fields they find direction because their abdomens tell them. Beetles can detect fires from 50 miles away and they deliberately go to seek them to mate. They're the burnt patches 50 miles away because of infrared radiation that they pick up on. Mosquitoes can smell our exhalations and know how to uh, detect carbon dioxide in the air. So on that note, if you're suffering from things like uh, dyslexia or color blindness or the things you've always been told have made you deficient, I'd like to reframe that a little bit. Find your special gifts, your uniqueness, your diversity. Find those uneven lines of development, the intelligence, and develop the ones so that you're more even. Um, I, I was really, really bad at math at school, um, except for geometry. Actually, I was very spatially aware because I'm visual, physio-spatial intelligence, but algebra, not so much. So I have to work on those things to become a more even balanced human. Balancing my checkbook doesn't come easy to me, but I have other gifts. So focusing on your psychograph, celebrating that uniqueness and figuring out how you can contribute to society, because it's always more than just you. It's how can you, like those creatures, have that interconnection, the relationship between you and your context. That's where intelligence, the rubber hits the road. There's no point in just being a genius yourself in your room alone. So how can you bring those forward? How can you start to believe in those? How can you develop those lines of intelligence? How can you become more even and believe in your gifts? So I'm gonna hand it back to Jen to say goodbye and she's gonna add some more and I'm just gonna say goodbye and how much I've enjoyed this episode and I'll see you next time, but Jen is gonna continue with ecological intelligence. Over to you, Jen. Well, I just want to say that I think our many intelligences are incredibly sexy and that we are on the cutting edge of what it means to be sexy and our many intelligence as many intelligencing beings. <laughs> yes, I love this move we're making towards relational participatory connections with each other and with our earth home which as Sally keeps pointing us to is life-saving for us and many other species right now. Um, I love this discussion of broadening our understanding of intelligence and especially to include nature and the deep intelligence of the universe that informs all of us. As Sally said, it's not our goal here to center human intelligence. There are tons of intelligences in nature, many of which we are only now just discovering in the last few decades. Um, two of my favorite theorists on animal intelligence are Dr. Mark Beckoff and Dr. Julie Morley. Um, Julie, Dr. Morley is a dear friend of mine, a colleague in graduate school who studied crow communities she meticulously researched the rich and layered generations of crows throughout Portland um, and Seattle. And her work shows how deeply intelligent crows are, how they use memory and language and tools. Um, 
And people who spend time with these Crow communities, like Dr. Morley did, um, become deeply aware that intelligence is not reserved for just humans. And in her dissertation, which I highly recommend, and that um, I'll we'll put a link to an article that um, she did with Dr. Beckoff in Psychology Today about animal intelligence. But what she found in her dissertation is that crow intelligence has evolved alongside human intelligence. They are relational and they have a lot in common, our two types of intelligences. So like Dr. Morley, Dr. Beckoff studies the emotional lives of animals. And his work is, is illustrating the complex intelligence that really challenges this view that animals have inferior intelligence, as Sally said. Um, animals, there are animals um, that can do things that we can't do. Um, so we're, we're, as we're challenging um, the pathologizing of neurodivergent minds, we also want to challenge the idea that animals in nature are not intelligent. Animal lovers and nature lovers know this to be true in our bones. Nature's intelligence is so obvious just by looking out the window. I mean, I think it's completely radical that trees are communicating with each other using feedback loops that are underground. Wow, can we communicate with each other like that? <laughs> How tiny hummingbirds fly thousands of miles to get to their seasonal destinations. Just an unbelievable feat of strength and fortitude. And how spiders weave their webs using acoustic sound waves, just like musicians pluck the strings on the guitar. Wow, incredible musical intelligence there. And so, as humans with profound capacities for multiple intelligences, I believe, and Sally believes, that we are born from that intelligence. So where does this ability to hold multiple intelligences come from? Well, there's a lot to say about that. And like Sally said, we can't be comprehensive here because it's a huge topic and our time is limited, but I'll say this. Our universe is a source of radical intelligence that has given us this earth, this body, this reality. So in essence, we are channels for radical intelligence as, as, as the microcosm in the macrocosm. So why not celebrate our many intelligences as the expressions from our source? And maybe, as Sally's been pointing us to, this is the missing link we need. I wouldn't say maybe, I would say it is. The missing link we need to solve our deepest ecological problems because there's a lot of bad things going down. Climate change, multiple species extinctions, um, mass starvation, um, seeing our multiple intelligences as arising from nature might be the key to starting to participate with nature in this reciprocal relational way instead of always taking from it. Because right now, I don't know about you, but I don't look out and see a species, us as a species, engaging with nature and our animal family very intelligently right now with our attitude of domination and dominion over nature. So maybe redefining our intelligence as part of nature will help us tap into the wisdom that we need in order to deal with our short-sighted perspectives and most unsustainable behaviors. Because we are born from an incredibly intelligent universe. We have lots of intelligences to tap into. And you can't help but see those intelligences when you look out into the night sky or out into a field, into a, a field or into a forest, we come and we will return to that intelligence. Our greatest gift that we can give to each other is our time and attention. And you have given Sally and I that gift today, and we are incredibly grateful. We hope if you have questions 
or anything you would like us to address here on the podcast that you'll reach out to us. We love hearing from you and it's been a lot of fun getting your feedback. So we welcome it until next time. Be well. So thanks for joining us. And we hope you can take away some helpful tools, perhaps some great stories and some wisdom for your own ongoing journey. Join us for our next episode where we will deep dive again into a universe of transformation.